Welcome to the Unlift, guys. Today I have a fun conversation for you. Uh, hopefully it's fun. I, I think it'll be fun. But it's the conversation of powerhouses versus beast modes. You know, the powerhouse fragrances from the mid 70s until about the early 90s versus the beast mode fragrances from about the late 2000s until pretty much the present day. Okay. Now, if you remember my episode on constants and variables where I discussed the more things change, the more they really kind of stay the same, you know, and I named examples like how in the 70s guys wanted to wear fragrances to feel sexed up to get attention in the disco halls and all that stuff and the pool halls and the marketing of the fragrances was so blatant in terms of sex appeal. You literally had a fragrance called sex appeal for crying out loud. So, and then stuff like Macho, you had a fragrance called Macho, fragrance called Turbo. So, you know, these fragrances knew what they were doing and the guys who wore them knew what they were doing. And then fast forward, and in today's cologne buying public, the cologne guys, now they're called, uh, they're not called cologne guys, now they're called compliment bros now, but the same purpose. They wear a fragrance to announce themselves when they enter a space. You know, the cologne guys in the 70s draped in high karate walk into the office and they're like hey jam what's up like that today it's the same thing you have the guy if you even go to an office because of you know everything with all the work from home stuff if you even have a social job where you have to be around people you walk into the workplace and you're drenched in salvage and you're like hey jan or whatever right same thing maybe it's jan's a granddaughter who's also named jan who knows point is it's the same person several generations removed and just you know bell bottoms and afro is now replaced with skinny jeans and side cut or whatever and pink hair or something okay same person though you know so constants and variables powerhouse beast mode but the question is what's the constant here and what's the variable are they really the same fragrance just with different approaches or are they related but functionally different that's the question I give to you guys now those of you out there the boomers you know who are in your 20s or 30s in the 80s you can probably answer this a little better than us younger guys because I was born in 81 so I was a little kid in the 80s I was a teenager in the 90s the Gen Xers, I mean, I'm kind of at the edge of Gen X, starting into millennial, but the ones who were born in the early 70s and were coming of age, you know, they were teenagers in the 80s, the real, the real latchkey Gen Xers. You might know a little bit too, but the boomers probably will know the most because they were the ones who were hitting their 20s in the 70s or 20s in the 80s, depending on the, the boomer generation was, was like very big. The boomers were like 20 years of human productivity, <laughs> reproductivity, I guess, but you get my point. All the post-war babies, you were coming of age in the 80s, late 70s, 80s. You can probably answer me a little more uh, authoritatively whether or not you think the powerhouses from back then were the same as what we call beast mode fragrances now. Or maybe, maybe they weren't because you also have to remember, guys, that everything was strong in the 80s everything was strong in the 70s and the reason is you had a lot of cars that didn't have catalytic converters still on the road you know cars from the 60s and the 50s were still on the road in the 80s the 70s still on the road in the 80s all right smoking was still allowed basically everywhere so with a lot of toxic fumes in general just in the air the collective sense of smell was kind of dull so everything was stronger because people needed stronger fragrances to even smell what they were wearing you know these days everything is sterile everything is clean people are driving cars that have massive amounts of pollutant controls on them people are, are driving electric cars you can't smoke anywhere and people in general just don't even outside smoking has declined greatly overall so the air is arguably a lot cleaner now people have a stronger more sensitive sense of smell now than they had 20 years ago maybe so nowadays a fragrance that may not have been seen as a powerhouse back then will seem like one now we have to make that historical distinction that maybe the guy wearing oscar de la renta 
or the, the lady wearing Giorgio didn't see their fragrances as all that strong back then. Even though restaurants and stuff complained. I mean, there were news articles. You can read them. There were news articles where they banned poison. They banned Giorgio. They banned obsession from fine dining places, from certain shopping places. Like, no, you can't wear cologne if you come in here. You can't wear perfume. Because of the collective reaction to the high-octane, high-powered 80s fragrances. So they were kind of all powerhouse. In a sense, in a sense, they were all powerhouses. But then you had the powerhouses among powerhouses. You know, you had the aforementioned Giorgio and Poison were very, very top end in terms of power. A lot of the Estee Lauder stuff in general was very, very potent. You know, Koros, all the real strong Greek name fragrances, Koros, Antaeus, Zerius, very powerful fragrances one man show it's very clear what one man show is out to achieve right the name says it all dior fahrenheit fahrenheit should tell you everything you need to know about how strong that fragrance is meant to be so yeah there were fragrances that were designed from the ground up to be powerful all right make no mistake there were powerhouses among powerhouses and the general understanding from people including younger people is that to have a powerhouse fragrance, it has to go on strong. It has to project fairly well. Maybe not like across the street well. It has to project fairly well. It has to be strong. And the wearer, and this is an important distinction, guys, the wearer needs to be able to smell that fragrance the whole day. From the moment it touches your skin to the moment you scrub it off, you need to be able to detect your powerhouse fragrance. So from hour one to hour 12 or whatever. If you're still smelling the fragrance you put on, that's a powerhouse, especially if it's an older fragrance. Now, we can look at the modern day phenomenon of beast mode fragrances, and we can say, well, okay, they seem to be functionally the same. They're very strong. They may tend to go a little more towards projection than wearer identification. And this is another important distinction. Most of your so-called beast mode fragrances, if you notice, a lot of wearers of the beast mode fragrances go nose blind to them, which leads them to complain that the strong fragrance is not as strong as maybe it once was. You know, they're like, oh, the new batches are weak, or my bottle has faded, or some crap like that, they say. You know, my bottle of Sauvage is not as potent as it was when I first bought it, you know. My BR540 is not as strong as it once was. And this is a very important distinction. So the beast mode fragrances tend to be more so for the observer than the wearer. The wearer will build up an immunity to the fragrance, won't be able to smell it. And quite possibly due to the combination of musks used in a lot of these newer fragrances and the chemical singularity and the hydrophobic nature of them as well, They'll probably dry your sinuses out and give you nosebleeds and cause other problems before you smell the fragrance, right? I've had so many modern day powerful fragrances, singular chemical strength, you know, massive timber silk, massive ISOE, massive ambroxan, massive woody ambers like Amber Extreme, Amber Max, Norlimbanol, massive amounts of these materials. And you wear them and you enjoy them for maybe a couple hours and then you can't smell them anymore. And then of course the people put more on thinking that it's the fragrance isn't strong enough and all they're doing is doubling down and tripling down the projection. So now people from like the next time zone can smell them but they can't smell themselves anymore and they think there's a problem with the fragrance. Meanwhile, you've got everybody in the neighborhood wearing gas masks. Oh my God, I can smell this guy from like three miles over. I can smell him, you know. And yeah, that's a beast mode fragrance, guys. So that's one thing I can tell you right now that's a variable, not a constant. The kind of guy that wears a powerhouse fragrance may be similar to or the same as the kind of guy who wears a beast mode fragrance 30 or 40 years removed from one another. But the actual visceral effect of the powerhouse is different from the beast mode fragrance. Because if I overspray Koros, 
or I overspray a really oak moss heavy sheep or I overspray something with a lot of patchouli in it like Givenchy Gentleman or Giorgio for men. I won't go nose blind to those fragrances. I'll just get a headache. I'll just straight up literally get a headache. I'll put a lot of chorus on. I'll put a lot of gentlemen on, whatever. And then I'm suddenly going, oh my God, I've got a sinus headache. I got to go take some Advil. I got to wash it off. Literally, I cause myself pain. But it's very quick and it's over with pain because once I wash it off, the headache is gone, right? Easy peasy, lemon squeezy. Now, the Beast Mode fragrances, which have a much simpler formula, much more... Uh, chemical formula in general. They're using the patchouli isolates and not full patchouli oil. They're using the woody ambers, like I said. Okay, I spray them on and I don't get a headache. It's fine. I feel nothing at all. I just don't smell the fragrance after an hour. My brain goes, nope, and tunes it out. Just completely tunes it out. And then what happens? My sinuses dry completely out. And a day or two later, day or two later, I get the dry sinus pain. I get the nosebleeds. I get that long-term side effect from the hydrophobic materials drying my face out. So the Koros and the Antaeus gives me the headache right now because it's all that power, all that siage. I'm basically, my, my brain's like, this is too much, you know. I will choke on it first. Before I get a nosebleed, I will choke on it. The Beast Mode fragrance, I'll put it on and I'll feel fine that day. I'll feel fine. But the next day, the day after, <laughs> it catches up to me. It's like the difference between drinking a good distilled spirit that gets you drunk right now and then it's over with and there's no hangover to a cheap spirit or a real sugary, a real sugary spirit where, uh, the drunk will creep up on you and then you'll get sick and you'll throw up because then it just it hits you over time. You know, that's a little bit of an analogy for you there. Now, another distinction that I personally like to make, this is just me. Beast mode fragrance. Again, Oscar de la Renta, something like that. Yada gone. All right. That stuff is really strong in the moment. You know, when I wear it, it's powerful. It lasts all day on my skin. I can detect it until I hit the shower that night and I scrub it off. But my shirt, the next day, it's not on my shirt anymore. It's gone. I can't pick up my shirt and smell traces of Antaeus or smell traces of Koros on my shirt. But I wear something like Diorome, the new one, not the Iris one, but the 2020 or the Diorome Sport. I wear that. And like I said, really strong all day. I've got to be careful if I put too much of it on. I go anosmic, I go nose blind, and I get the headaches later and the nosebleeds later from my body going, what is this? However, it is on my shirt. And it is so chemically stable and so tenacious that I've literally taken a work shirt and I've washed it in a tub full of other laundry, okay, a whole load of laundry in there, and I pull it out, and the Diorome is still on the collar. Like, I'm actually having that problem right now because I wore Diorome last week, and I laundered my uniform, and it survived. It literally survived hot water and survived Tide soap. And I even put uh, dryer sheets in it too, so it survived that. It survived bounce and Tide and hot water. So, all week this week, I've been wearing my work shirt and I've been smelling whatever I'm wearing plus Diorome. I catch whiffs of Diorome on the back of my work shirt. And it's driving me nuts, actually. I'm about to wash my shirt again when I go home. Typically, I wash it at the end of the week because I wear it Monday through Friday. But it's just, I can't get rid of the Diorome. It's just on the fabric like forever. It's like a nuclear isotope. It's like cesium-187 or something. It's just like spent uranium rod. It's just in my clothes. It has like a half-life. It has like a radioactive half-life. It's ridiculous. And I can say that no powerhouse from the 80s or 70s has ever given me that problem. I've never had to take a shirt with polo on it or take a shirt 
with any odor fragrance. It's very powerful. And wash it twice. Scrub it with a brush real hard. And like literally rip the material out of the freaking shirt to get the smell out. Never had to do that. Except for with a modern day potent fragrance. So yeah, there are variables here. The powerhouse and the beast mode are not created equal in that regard. Now we can get really in the weeds here if you want to. We can talk about why. So my opinion, backed up by a little bit of scientific fact, what I know, a layman's understanding, is that the old powerhouse fragrances were made to be strong, but they used a base or they used bases that were effectively composite bases. They were many materials, a lot of them natural materials, woven together. Oak moss and patchouli, you know, patchouli, oak moss, tolu balsam, uh, alabanum from frankincense, myrrh, okay, ethyl vanilla if they had vanilla in them. Uh, you know, sandalwood, real sandalwood, or maybe polysantol for talking in the 90s when sandalwood began to go away. But still, very composite bases, you know. So we're talking, coumarin was holding hands with oak moss, was holding hands with patchouli, with labdanum, and then any number of musks. And we're talking not just clean white musks, we're talking uh, animalic musks too. We're talking castorium, we're talking civet. We're talking uh, Tonka Tone, which is synthetic Tonkin musk. We're talking Nitro musks too. All right, we're talking all that stuff. So the bases were very, very compounded. They were very compounded bases. And if there were lighter materials, you know, if there were various acetates, like benzoyl acetate offers a little bit of a sweet lift to a fragrance, for instance, you know, if there was some kind of hedione in there, if there were any of the various ionones or irones in there to create the violet smells and the iris smells, if there were any of the damascenones in there to give you fruity, rosy, woody elements like beta damascenone as a, as a rose material, whatever. Those synthetics were typically uh, on top, you know, and then above that you'd have your citruses, your citronella, you know, you might have linalool in there from the lavender they used. And then of course, all the hides, all the hides, all the hides, all day. So point is, those powerhouse fragrances, the synthetic materials burned off first. The synthetic materials tended to be the introduction. A classic powerhouse fragrance uses the aldehydes, uses the white floral materials to bring you in. And then it settles you down with the heavy composite base, which is mostly a 50-50-ish natural synthetic blob, right? Now we look to the beast mode fragrances and we can see an almost equal inversion of that. Since naturals are so expensive now and they don't want to use hardly any naturals at all, they're going to put whatever naturals they are going to use as top notes. So when you smell a fragrance like Sauvage, there is a little bit of real vacuum distant, uh, bleh, Vacuum distilled, <laughs> tongue tie there. Sauvage does have a little bit of vacuum distilled bergamot essence in it. It's not pure bergamot oil because Ifra won't let them do that. They've got to use the vacuum distilled essence stuff, you know. But there is technically a little bit of real bergamot in Sauvage. And there is technically a little bit of real lavandin in Sauvage too, okay. So there are some naturals in Sauvage. And a lot of your big uh, beast mode fragrances have a little bit of naturals, but it's all up top, mixed in with the aldehydes and everything else. And then once you hit the bottom, once you hit the base, then after all those heavy hitting uh, woody amber chemicals and all the other stuff gets you. So it's an exact inversion, you know, with the powerhouse fragrances, you got the synthetics on top and then you made your way into more of a mixed media base, right? Mixed media is the key word here. Then you get into the beast mode fragrances and you get the naturals and the mixed media up top and then almost complete synthetics in the base. And synthetics are known to be much more chemically stable. Am I wrong? They're much more chemically stable, usually. So therein is the key difference. The thing that separates the powerhouse from the beast mode fragrance. Now I put the ball in your court 
and I ask you to tell me if you think they are truly different or if they're the same thing using different methods to achieve similar results. That's up to you. That's the point of this video. Powerhouse versus beast mode. Discuss.